The goal of this screencast is to review signal transduction and information coding. Recall that signal transduction is a changing of information from one form to another, for example, from a light stimulus into a graded potential or an action potential into the release of neurotransmitter. The forms of information that you find used in the nervous system include various types of sensory stimuli, such as light, odor, taste of molecules, pressure, etc., graded potentials, action potentials, neurotransmitter release, and muscle contraction. As signals are transduced from one form to another, information about the original stimulus is conserved at each step. So as you go from the stimulus to a graded potential, a graded potential to action potentials, and action potentials to the release of neurotransmitter, information about the original stimulus is being conserved. Thus, our perception of the intensity of a stimulus is a faithful representation of the actual stimulus intensity as shown here. On the left, we see that as the amount of skin indentation is increased, the response of the mechanoreceptors increases. So we see this nice linear relationship here. On the right, we see that a human subject's estimation of the intensity of the stimulus matches the increase in stimulus intensity. So as stimulus intensity increases, the subject's perception of the intensity also increases. So can you get a nice linear relationship? These data help to illustrate that the neural coding of stimulus intensity is faithfully transmitted from the peripheral receptors to the cortical centers that mediate sensation. So let's review how neurons code information about magnitude and duration and conserve this information as it is transduced. We'll start with the graded potentials. These data show the graded potentials recorded in a stretch-sensitive afferent in response to different amplitudes or durations of muscle stretch. Note that as the intensity of the stimulus increases, for example, this stretch compared to this stretch, the amplitude of the graded potential increases. And as the duration of the stimulus increases, for example, compare these two stretches, you see that the duration of the graded potential increases. Thus, the amount of change in the memory potential and how long it stays different from baseline tells you about the magnitude of the stretch and how long it lasted. Thus, we say that graded potentials are graded, meaning that they convey information about the magnitude and duration of a stimulus based on their amplitude and duration. Graded potentials can vary from about 0.1 millivolts to 50 millivolts in amplitude and 1 to 100 milliseconds in duration. Typically, you find that they're about 0.1 to 10 millivolts in amplitude and about 1 to 10 milliseconds in duration. Recall that action potentials are fairly stereotyped under normal conditions. A typical action potential is about 1 to 10 milliseconds in duration and about 70 to 110 millivolts in amplitude. Thus, action potentials are not graded and do not normally vary in their amplitude or duration. They therefore need another mechanism to code the information. So instead of grading their amplitude and duration, action potentials convey information based on their frequency, and the duration of the spike train, meaning the period of time over which the cell is producing action potentials. This is determined by the amplitude and duration of the graded potentials. The higher the amplitude of the graded potential, the higher the frequency of action potentials. The longer the duration of the graded potential, the longer the duration of the spike train. And that's what's illustrated in these data. Again, we see that the original stimulus, as we increase intensity, we saw an increase in the amplitude of the graded potential. And with increases in the amplitude of the graded potential, we see differences in the frequencies of action potentials that are produced. Whereas if we have a different duration stimulus, we had a different duration graded potential. And what we now observe is that the period of time over which action potentials are being evoked is different. Now, a phenomenon that many people notice in these data is something known as adaptation. So it's worth discussing at this point. Adaptation means that even though a stimulus remains constant, as we have occurring here, 
the response of the cell decreases. So in this case, we see that even though the stimulus remains constant, there's a decline in the receptor potential amplitude and a corresponding decrease in the frequency of action potentials over time. So why does this occur? Many mechanoreceptors show adaptation. Some mechanoreceptors adapt very rapidly, while others adapt more slowly. So for example, the mechanoreceptor on the left adapts more slowly. We have a constant stimulus, in fact, three different constant stimuli, and we see that over time, we see adaptation in the firing frequency of the mechanoreceptor while the receptor on the right adapts more rapidly, and we only see it responding at the beginning and the end of the stimulus. The rate of adaptation in a mechanoreceptor depends on various mechanical, electrical, or biochemical processes in the different cell types. So as you can see here, receptors that adapt more slowly can better encode duration of a maintained stimulus and are good tonic receptors. On the other hand, rapidly adapting receptors are specialized to detect changes in the stimulus and are good for reporting phasic responses. And so another difference that we see is that if the stimulus changes more slowly, these receptors will continue to fire as long as there's a change occurring. So again, they're, they're very good re at reporting information about changes, whereas the slowly adapting receptors are good at reporting information about the duration of a stimulus. Recall that when an action potential reaches the synaptic terminal, it triggers the release of neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter release is also graded. Neurotransmitter release is determined by the frequency of action potentials and the duration of the spike train. The higher the frequency of action potentials, the more neurotransmitter that's released. The longer the duration of the spike train, the longer period of time that neurotransmitter is released for. And that is again shown in these data. So if we compare again these two, where we had a lower versus higher amplitude stretch uh, producing a lower and higher frequency of action potentials, we get less or more neurotransmitter being released. And in this third case, we have a longer duration stimulus so that we're producing action potentials for a longer period of time and it's kind of difficult to tell in this figure but neurotransmitter would be released for a longer period of time. Thus information is conserved at each transduction step. Receptor potentials are graded in their amplitude and duration to reflect the intensity and duration of the sensory stimulus. The amplitude and duration of the receptor potentials then determines the frequency of action potentials and the duration of the spike train. The frequency of action potentials and duration of the spike train then determines how much neurotransmitter gets released and for how long. And the neurotransmitter release then determines the amplitude and duration of the graded potential in the postsynaptic cell, and so on. There's one final point we should consider about signaling the nervous system. The nervous system uses the same types of signals to convey information about sight, sound, taste, smell, etc. So how does it know if a neural signal like an action potential means there's a visual stimulus or a sound stimulus, etc.? The meaning of information conveyed by neural signals is determined by the pathway or neural circuit that the information travels, as well as the patterns of activity. Thus, if signals originate in the muscle spindle, the nervous system knows that the neural signals relate to how much the muscle was stretched. If the signals originate in the olfactory receptors, the nervous system knows that the neural signals relate to the type and strength of odor. Our brain thus keeps track of where sensory information is coming from to appropriately create our everyday sensations of sight, touch, taste, smell, sound, etc. That concludes a screencast on signal transduction and information coding. If you have any questions, please bring them to recitation or office hours.